What are some of the weirdest crimes people do? Let's get right to it with number five, the decaying practice. James Tolliver Craig, a dentist from Aurora, Colorado, allegedly went after his 43-year-old wife, Angela James, by poisoning her. James took his wife to the hospital as she was complaining of dizziness and severe headaches. When they got to the hospital, her condition quickly deteriorated and doctors moved her to the ICU and placed her on a ventilator. Not long after, Angela's medical team couldn't find any brain activity and she was taken off life support. They were suspicious of her rapid deterioration and reported the incident to the police. An investigation into James's online searches gave a much clearer picture of what exactly had happened to his wife. He'd searched for places to buy oleander, a poisonous plant, looked up how much pure arsenic is necessary to be fatal for a human, and searched to see if arsenic would be detectable in an autopsy. It wasn't the first time James attempted to poison his wife. His sister informed police that James had poisoned Angela five to six years before and tried to make it look like she did it herself. The last time, James had given Angela an unknown substance. He told her he had planned to, let's just call it off himself. So he had given her the unknown substance so she wouldn't find him or try to save him. The lethal substances in James's system would have kicked in before the substances in Angela's bloodstream wore off. As James's actions would suggest, the couple's marriage was unhappy. He was on the edge of bankruptcy for a second time and Angela had told her sister that their financial situation was dire. James ordered a shipment of arsenic to be dropped off at their home and had potassium cyanide delivered to his office. Before admitting Angela to the hospital, James informed his office manager that he was expecting a package and instructed her not to open it. However, when the package arrived, another employee opened it anyway. The office manager looked inside and found a circular canister with a biohazard sticker and a potassium cyanide label. On March 6, 2023, James made Angela a protein shake before they worked out together. He gave her extra protein if she was feeling sluggish, but by the end of their workout, she was so faint and sluggish that he took her to the hospital. One of James's longtime friends and business partners spoke to one of the attending nurses at the hospital and shared that he thought Angela was poisoned. The business partner informed the nurse about the potassium cyanide canister James ordered to the dental office, despite no medical need or purpose for it to be at a dental office. Office. The partner confronted James about the package, to which James claimed it contained a ring for his wife. However, the partner didn't believe him and demanded to know why he would buy cyanide. So James quickly decided to change his story, admitting that yes, the package did contain cyanide, but it was Angela that made him order it as she was suicidal and he wanted to call her bluff and snap her out of it. As a mandatory reporter, the nurse called the police who launched an investigation into the matter. The investigation revealed that James had been sending explicit and personal emails to an orthodontist in Austin, Texas that he was having an affair with. They allegedly made travel plans for his mistress to visit him on dates, lining up with Angela's various hospital stints. They also had a trip booked for the day Angela entered the hospital and later passed away. They had purchased their tickets the very same day the arsenic arrived at James's home. It's like all that was missing was for it to be her birthday as well. Before her passing, Angela feared James had poisoned her again. When she first exhibited symptoms in early early March, Angela texted her husband that she felt like she'd been poisoned and was going to the hospital. James responded that he hadn't poisoned her again, something that many loving husbands have said before, so it was totally not suspicious, right? But he agreed that she looked pale and expressed concern. Police believed she had arsenic in her system during that time. James filed for professional and personal bankruptcy in 2020. His dental practice, Summerbrook Dental, was running with an approximate $120,000 monthly loss, and James had accumulated over two $2 million in personal debt. James dug himself into a hole with a series of bad investments. He sunk over a million dollars into a cryptocurrency named ExtraOption.Gold, which he hoped would prop up his business. Instead, the investment cost him significant money, and ExtraOption.Gold is now better known as Fool's Gold. Another of his investments was in a crypto Ponzi scheme, where he lost $600,000. James believed he would generate more than $40,000 monthly by purchasing three big 
BitText blockbuster machines from James Wolfgram. Wolfgram was accused of pretending to be a crypto millionaire who ripped off multiple victims for millions through his company BitText. When James asked Wolfgram when he would receive the machines, Wolfgram pledged his $15 million Florida home as collateral for the joint venture in a personal guarantee and collateral agreement. Unfortunately for James, Wolfgram didn't disclose that he didn't and never had owned the home in question. By the time James filed for the bankruptcies, he was hemorrhaging money. He owed the IRS $314,998 and had $750,000 in other debts, including over $200,000 on assorted credit cards. James had three life insurance policies on his wife, valued at a little over $80,000, which would have barely made a dent in covering his debts. James didn't think he was at fault for his financial difficulties and blamed those around him instead. He blamed the dental practice issues on Dr. Chris Brady, who, according to James, suggested he change the business model. James said that the change increased the business's expenses and forced him to bring on a new dentist who was a bad fit. James also claimed that they were buried in debt when they replaced the dentist. He also said he had to take out loans totaling roughly $1.7 million to cover increased expenses. Their business spending didn't exactly match the office's dire financial state. They spent over 60 grand on travel and almost $29,000 on meals and entertainment. James has been charged with the first degree murder of Angela James and faces additional charges related to the poisoning. If found guilty, he could face life imprisonment. Number four, just bury it. The former owner of a $15 million estate in California, Johnny Bakhtun Liu, had an extensive criminal history that dated back to 1965 with charges that included insurance fraud. In 1999, Liu hired people to sink his $1.2 million yacht to cash in on the insurance money. Liu instructed them to drive the 56-foot craft named Corwell past the Golden Gate Bridge and into international waters where they would sink it to the bottom. Unfortunately for Liu, the men he hired were undercover police officers in a sting operation. They hid the yacht, but told Lou they had sunk it. He paid them $30,000 in cash and $20,000 in gold watches and reported the luxury boat stolen to American Yachts Limited. The incident was certainly not Lou's first interaction with law enforcement. In 1965, a jury found him guilty of shooting Karen Gervaisi, a 21-year-old woman, in his Los Angeles County apartment. He tried to convince the court that Gervaisi accidentally did it to herself, but nobody believed him. In 1968, the California Supreme Court reversed the conviction, citing hearsay evidence that shouldn't have been allowed in the trial. While Lou got to walk free, he didn't stay out of trouble for long. In 1977, he was back in court again for going after another person, this time a guy, and the jury found him guilty on two counts, and he spent three years in prison. Lou passed away in 2015 after suffering from lung cancer. Years after his passing in October 2022, police discovered a buried Mercedes-Benz on his former Atherton estate, where he lived with his family in the 1990s. Authorities uncovered that Lou reported the vehicle stolen in 1992 and received between $87,000 and $88,000 in insurance money for the stolen car. He buried the vehicle with unused bags of concrete. The police brought cadaver dogs to the scene and picked up the scent of possible human remains, although authorities didn't find any in the vehicle. It's weird that this concrete evidence wasn't concrete at all. Number three, professional test taking. Inderjeet Kaur, a woman from South Wales, ran a criminal operation where she charged people hundreds of dollars for her to take their driving tests for them. Between 2018 and 2020, Kaur sat through 150 theory and practical driving tests for candidates who struggled with the English language. Once she passed their tests, she handed them their driving licenses. Staff at driving test centers were suspicious of Kaur and reported her to the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency, known as the DVSA, which is the organization responsible for driving tests in the UK. The DVSA referred the case to local authorities who opened an investigation. And Cower wasn't the only person guilty of test fraud. Around 200 miles away in Derby, England, a staff member at a driving test center noticed a woman who seemed to be taking a test on behalf of someone else. Authorities launched a search to find the woman who had been spotted throughout the UK and released a picture of her in an attempt to identify her. Between Cower and the unidentified woman, they fraudulently took tests 
arrests in at least 10 counties across England and Wales. Their cases weren't isolated incidents either. As of December 2022, driving test fraud was on the rise in the UK. The fraudulent driving test caused public safety concerns as the fraudsters enabled unqualified and potentially dangerous drivers to obtain legitimate licenses. Public officials feared there would be a rise in serious accidents. The DVSA sent out a notice urging people to report drivers they suspect are sitting a test for someone else and warned that it's against the law to cheat during a driving or theory test. They also warned of the serious ramifications of posing as someone else when taking a test, such as prison sentences, court costs, fines, driving bans, and unpaid work. Additionally, the DVSA planned measures to crack down on the situation to prevent any unqualified or unsafe drivers getting behind the wheel. Authorities uncovered Cower's scheme and arrested her. She pleaded guilty, and the court sentenced her to eight months in prison. A man guilty of the same crime, who charged over $1,000 per test, was sent to 18 months in jail. Judging from all all the bad drivers where we live, the women must be operating here too. At least someone is putting the brakes on this scam. Number two, faking a city. When the city of Newark entered into a sister city partnership with the United States of Kailasa, or USK, they thought they were establishing a relationship with the first sovereign state for Hindus. However, they'd soon learn that the nation was nothing of what it seemed. The USK nation was created to honor Paramhamsa Netiananda, the so-called Supreme Pontiff of Hinduism, or SPH. The country claimed to have a population of 2 billion practicing Hindus and had its own flag, central bank, and passport. Unfortunately for Newark, the country didn't exist. The Kailasa group, which followed Netiananda's teachings, claimed to have extended campuses in 150 countries and promoted a form of Hinduism centered around its leader's alleged miraculous powers. His powers included delaying the sunrise and teaching cattle to speak Tamil. However, the spiritual leader couldn't find a way to miraculously get himself off of the radar of Indian police, who wanted him on pretty serious charges dealing with, let's just call the non-consent issues and some abductions. Why did Netiananda want sister city status? Since the Kailasa group looked very much like a cult, if they gained sister city status, they would appear more credible and be able to recruit people in the United States. For Netiananda, having American recruits meant more money. Netiananda didn't attend the sister city ceremony, where Vijayapriya Netiananda represented USK instead. She identified herself as the permanent ambassador to the UN for the fake country. Vijayapriya described the USK as a country that was service-oriented, borderless, and established on the principle of oneness. Apparently, Vijayapriya also didn't know the difference between a country and a philosophy. Vijayapriya had a large tattoo of Nityananda's face on her bicep, which she had done in 2016 after participating in a program with Nityananda with thousands of other attendees. She claimed he made such a profound impact on her life that she wanted the tattoo as a daily reminder of his teachings. Many other followers use tattoos to express their spiritual affection for Nityananda, either of his face or of his mystical third eye, which he claimed could heal the blind. With such a devout following, it's no surprise that Newark wasn't the only place to fall for the idea that USK was a real place. 30 cities signed some sort of acknowledgement of the USK, including Pomona, California, Richmond, Virginia, and Delaware, Ohio. The USK scammed local, state, and national governments into entering sister city programs and other unofficial proclamations for almost 20 years. Even Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau sent a letter of support to USK for its Hindu Heritage Month celebration, and California Representative Norma Torres sent a certificate of special recognition. Kailasa's representatives went to Geneva to meet with the United Nations, where they described their nation as the first sovereign state for Hindus. No wonder they were proud and passionate about their nation when they believed their ruler was so powerful. On top of preaching that he could delay the sunrise, teach cattle to speak Tamil, and heal the blind, he also claimed to have ESP and X-ray vision, like a Hindu Superman. Six days after Newark signed the sister agreement, the city learned that the USK wasn't a real country or city and dissolved the partnership. Today, Nityananda is a fugitive from justice. While hiding from Indian law enforcement, he still preaches online as his followers build out a network of nonprofits within the US. Before we get to number one, if you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay tuned for our past release for more stories about weird crimes, such as this influencer who was forced into scamming her own followers. Number one, Pras Michelle Super Spy? 
Rapper and former member of the Fugees, Pras Michel accepted millions of dollars from Joe Lo, a Malaysian financier, to help him make political connections and influence people. Michel met Joe Lo at a New York City nightclub in 2006. Their relationship developed into a business partnership where Lo paid Michel with money he stole from the Malaysian government to make influential and political connections. Lo leaned on Michel heavily for his political connections and influence. Michel helped Lo by doing things such as reimbursing guests to attend a fundraising dinner for President Obama's 2020 presidential campaign. Allegedly, Michelle funneled $1 million of Lowe's funds into Obama's campaigns through 20 donors to avoid suspicion. When the Trump administration took office, Lowe gave Michelle over $100 million to convince then-President Donald Trump to drop a federal investigation into Lowe. Understandably, Lowe did everything he could to guarantee legal protection against the U.S. government. He allegedly ran one of the biggest financial scams in history, which involved turning the Malaysian government's slush budget into his bank account. Lo allegedly stole billions of dollars from 1MDB, the Malaysian government's investment fund. He used the money to buy luxury real estate, yachts, private jets, artwork, and his lavish, celebrity-filled lifestyle. Lo even funded the Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese box office hit The Wolf of Wall Street. Michelle accepted between $8 million and $40 million for his role. Lo sent Michelle on missions, such as to convince the U.S. government to hand over Chinese billionaire Miles Guo to Chinese authorities. Guo resided in the U.S. and was an ally of Steve Bannon. Guo and Bannon developed a close relationship and worked together to expose corruption in the Chinese government. Bannon publicly praised Guo, and Guo appeared on GTV, Bannon's media platform. They discussed China-related issues, and Guo was a vocal critic of the Chinese Communist Party and accused the government of corruption and a blatant disregard of human rights. Bannon and Guo collaborated on several initiatives, such as launching a media company to challenge the Chinese Communist Party and a documentary exposing the government's handling of the COVID-19 outbreak in Wuhan. As a favor to Chinese leaders, Lo wanted to hand Guo over to Beijing as a form of protection against the U.S. government as U.S. prosecutors were investigating Lo's business dealings. Allegedly, Lo helped fund the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation and allegedly used stolen funds to buy artwork auctioned off at a charity event for the foundation. DiCaprio returned the artwork to the U.S. government as part of a settlement to resolve claims that stolen money was used to purchase the artwork. When DiCaprio learned of Michelle's involvement in the scheme, he contacted the Justice Department and worked with investigators to determine if his foundation received gifts or charitable donations directly or indirectly related to Lowe and his associates. Despite the accusations, Michelle denied ever acting as an agent for China and claimed he thought he was helping the U.S. His defense attorneys argued that he had followed the advice of his attorneys and acted in the U.S. government's interest. Additionally, Michelle's lawyer stated that Michelle was unaware of the extent of Lowe's scheme and believed the money Lowe gave him was intended for legitimate projects. Lowe is on the run, having been charged with money laundering and other financial crimes by U.S. and Malaysian authorities. The U.S. government has seized assets he bought with stolen money, such as a $250 million yacht and a $30 million penthouse, while he claimed his innocence, many believe Lowe is hiding out in China. Michelle is currently standing trial for his involvement in Lowe's schemes and has pleaded not guilty to conspiracy charges, witness tampering, and failure to register as an agent of China. Just why? He scammed over 24 million bucks with a cow scam? And she was forced into scamming her followers on Instagram? Let's get right into some of the weirdest scams. Number five, cow scam. Around $24 million was the amount that Robert Blom from South Dakota stole from clients and investors in a cattle business that went sour when he was busted. Blom pleaded guilty to wire fraud and money laundering by scamming investors and making them believe his business was more successful than it really was. The man who grew up in Holland, South Dakota and had dedicated 15 years to his animal feeding business, would lure local farmers he already knew into buying cattle from him with the promise that he would feed them and sell them for profit. Blom altered financial documents and sold the same group of cattle to various buyers. Court documents state that over 50 individuals, including businesses, were scammed and millions of dollars were taken from them. One of them, the First Dakota National Bank, 
said Blom overdrew his account over $1 million and owed them more than $6 million in total, for which he was making an interest rate of $1,000 per day. Blom's victims included close friends like Jeff Hampton and co-workers like Robert Meyer, who spent 14 years doing business with Blom. Both of them talked in court and stated their financial losses. One of them asked the judge to impose the heaviest sentence the law required. It has been said by various South Dakota lawyers that this is one of the largest financial scams ever seen in the state. One of his biggest investors, Kurt Plamp, lost about $1 million. He was Blom's brother-in-law for 28 years and trusted his business abilities. Plamp would see small returns on his original $750,000 investment, only about $20,000 to $30,000. It was when Plamp's bank gave him a call that he became suspicious. The operation spanned a period of years from 2014 to 2019. During this time, Blom fraudulently told his investors he would use their money to buy new cattle to feed and sell, promising to pay them back with profits. Instead, he used their money to pay back old investors without actually selling the cattle. Blom purchased various groups of cattle from livestock companies that he later offered to multiple investors, claiming he would take care of both their investment and the cattle to be fed. According to court documents, Blom was aware he didn't have the amount of cattle he was claiming to sell, so he forged invoices to hide the fact he sold the same group of animals to multiple people. After the invoices were sent, Blom received checks from his investors for the requested amounts. Because he sold the same cattle to a lot of people, he wasn't able to pay back all of his investors, since he wasn't making any profit from the actual cattle sale to processing plants. In 2021, Blom pleaded guilty to one count of wire fraud and one count of money laundering out of the combined 32 charges he faced. He faced up to 40 years in prison. Blom was also presented with a $750,000 restitution fine ordered for the case. Overall, his scheme totaled about $24 million in losses and almost 30,000 animals that went missing. His financial woes date back to 2019 when he was charged for writing a bad check to another cattle buyer. For this, he was sentenced to five years in prison and eight years of probation. Number four, Fat James Bond. A man from Seaham, England, decided to fully live out his secret service spy fantasy by convincing his partner he was indeed a member of Britain's MI5. John Hare, a 53-year-old farmer, had told his girlfriend of five years he was working for MI5 and that was the reason he needed to carry a gun with him at all times. According to his partner, he would even carry his 22 with him while dining out. The scam, which lasted around 25 years, made all his closest relatives and partners believe he was actively working for the MI5. He eventually told his lovers he had started as a personal protection agent before he was tapped by the Secret Service. His fake spy lifestyle somehow allowed him to own several properties, including a private bungalow and the house farm he shared with his wife and kids. Turns out, Hare was actually married and his spy scam seemed to help him get some extra time for female partners. In fact, some of them were so convinced they were still in an official relationship that even when he was caught by the authorities, they thought they were exclusive. His spy facade served as the perfect excuse for him to deceive his multiple lovers. He even went on to give one of them the number of his MI5 unit so she could contact him in case of an emergency. Some of the women actually lived close by to his main house, one of them 10 minutes away and the other 15 minutes in the opposite direction. Hare was so good at convincing these women that he was able to make one of them leave her husband of 46 years. Overall, he was romantically linked to five different women. In reality, John Hare was a common farmer who ran a green waste recycling company. Company. When authorities first heard of Hare's case, it was through one of his girlfriends who claimed he had physically assaulted her after an altercation in his house. After further investigation and hearing the women's claims, they started looking for his 22 he supposedly had in his home. Hare had confessed he had the firearm, so police went to his farmhouse to search for it. They were directed to the chicken coop where 30 chickens lived by his wife. At one point, it was his wife who dug up the ground to uncover the hidden gun inside a bread bag. Hare said he had bought it around 2005 to shoot rats. Hare was sentenced to five and a half years in prison. Number three, Lunch Sisters. 
Two women who worked at a Connecticut school cafeteria were busted when it was discovered they were actually stealing money from the cash register at work. The money, which was stolen over the course of five years, amounted to almost $500,000. Joanne Pascarelli and Mary Wilson, sisters, had been working at the new Cannon High School cafeteria for a couple of years before police and the local board of education noticed the missing money was a staggering amount. They were both no strangers to drama. During their years of work, they had fostered a reputation as as very difficult co-workers. All of this was permitted by their boss, Bruce Gluck, head chef of the high school cafeteria. The new Cannon High School cafeteria was like no other. Farm-to-table products, gluten-free options, and low-calorie foods were, were all part of the very popular menu Gluck had created. After all, this was a small but very rich Connecticut town that had the budget to do so. While under Gluck's supervision, both sisters were considered Gluck's right hands and ran the high school's kitchen with a very tight grip. On occasions, there were even reports of food thrown and yelling in the workplace. New Cannon High School was taking in a lot of money through their cafeteria, around $2 million a year, with 5% being in cash. And while many schools would outsource the accounting of the service, New Cannon decided to do it themselves. Once Wilson was named into a supervising position, she had access to the many resources the cafeteria had. Wilson took over the duty of personally counting money after every shift, and at the end of the day, she wouldn't let cashiers do it. As the money was coming in every day in cash, both Wilson and Pascarelli took the larger bills and started taking a couple hundred dollars a day with them. They had no supervision. After a few years, Pascarelli started working at a different school nearby and thus their scam grew exponentially. She told one worker that she couldn't register the amount of cash made on the day and forced her to sign a deposit slip lower than the amount of money that went in. And while the school district implemented a new software to count the money and keep a digital registry, Pascarelli continued to count it herself and sign deposit slips because, according to her, the new system took too long. Their co-workers took notice of these strange proceedings and started going one by one to the police. Both Wilson and Pascarelli were accused by their co-workers of the shady financial schemes they were running at the two different schools. The school district started counting the money that had gone missing. It was discovered that both sisters had stolen from the schools a whopping $478,588. This was only in a period of five years because, according to the statute of limitations, they weren't allowed to investigate prior years believed their scam dated back to 15 years. Both sisters went to the police to speak, but there were others to blame. Wilson said she was forced by Glock to hand him $100 a day. She felt concerned and her job was on the line. Pascarelli was firm on her belief that no money had gone missing. She said that it was likely that the new food services director had a thing against her, or maybe the kids at school used each other's card pins. Both sisters were charged with larceny in 2018 and pleaded not guilty. They posted bail for $50,000 each before their trials. They were offered settlements. Gluck was also called to court because bank statements showed he had made large deposits of money during the time frame of the crime. Number two, cheating husband. As the co-owner of her late husband's trucking company, Frances Hall was accused of altering payroll documents and thus lowering the company's premium insurance payments to the state of Texas. According to officials, the company avoided around $9 million between 2009 and 2016. While these fraudulent schemes aren't uncommon in the business world, what makes this case strange was the situation that took place before her scamming. Hall had been convicted for murdering her husband, Bill Hall Jr., back in 2013. She had discovered him and his mistress driving driving down the highway in his Range Rover and motorcycle, and hit them with her Cadillac Escalade. After this, they got into a chase which ended with her running her car against her husband and his motorcycle. He was rushed to the hospital where he died. Francis was convicted in 2016 and was released in 2018. Hall was charged with aggravated assault and sentenced to two years in prison and was given a lower sentence because the judge considered she acted out of sudden passion. Hall believed firmly she didn't purposely go after her husband, but she deeply regretted having chased them down that day. She also stated that the woman his husband had an affair with had sent her multiple texts and videos. Aside from all this, Hall was able to keep her full husband's business. Even when her son, Justin, took her to court to battle the company's control, he was in intending to hand control over his father's half of the company to him and his sister Dominique, alleging she shouldn't be able to receive financial report from her crime. Hall's son was trying to take back 50% of the company since his father didn't leave any type of will and everything went directly to his mom. Unfortunately, the judge ruled in favor
favor of Francis, and she kept 100% control over the trucking company and other assets. The fraud charges that have been presented against her stem from illegal altering of payroll information that the company provided to Texas Mutual Insurance Company, while also hiding other payroll details that made the company insurance premium payments much lower than they should have legally been. She has been pointed as a direct culprit since the fraud scheme happened when she was co-owner of the company between 2009 and 2016. After an arrest warrant was issued, Hall faced charges for securing execution of a document over $200,000. After turning herself in, she was released on a $20,000 bail. Her lawyer state that Hall denies all allegations and is expected to defend herself in court. Number one, reverse influenced. Emma Tomlinson is an aspiring singer from Australia. She says that she had a breakdown when hackers stole her Instagram account. To make matters worse, they demanded her to record videos promoting a Bitcoin scam so they could scam more people. Tomlinson, who had managed to get a few thousand followers on Instagram, had turned to social media as a vehicle to promote her work and create an audience. She became known nationally when she competed in Australia's version of X Factor in 2014 and has been popular for her blend of pop, R&B, and classical crossover. Tomlinson said, she received a private message from a friend asking for her account details. Thinking it was a person she trusted, she handed over her email information, the same that links to her Instagram account. A few minutes later, she was locked out of her profile. Somehow, hackers had gotten a hold of a friend's account and posed as her. Added to this, the hackers asked for a $200 payment and requested she had to do a video promoting an illegal cryptocurrency scam. Tomlinson said she felt forced to do it so she could get her account back. She went on to shoot the video, stating the company was trusted and totally legit. After doing the video and paying the $200, the hackers told her that she had to pay an extra $3,000 or they would leak nude pictures of her, which were fake. Tomlinson was desperate, so she paid the amount. In the video, Tomlinson spoke about how she was able to see profits on her cryptocurrency investment only after three hours. She went on to say the deal was very real and the company very worthwhile. The video went online later. Tomlinson said she had a breakdown because of the implications of losing the platform she uses to promote her music and how devastating it was to lose control over her public Image. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section what you'd rather have, the ability to never have a hangover or the ability to never get drunk.